God forever. <laughs> In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Today is the third Sunday of the Blessed Month of Tuba. And I just want to point out a few of the verses today. In verse 25, we read from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 3. In verse 25, then there became a, a rose dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he's baptizing. And they're all going to him. And then in verse 28, he said, You yourselves bear witness of me that I said, I'm not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. And then in verse 30, he must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth, but he who comes from heaven is above all. Today I want to look at a similar situation that happened to St. Paul as well. This is not the first time right, that we encounter these kind of dynamics in the Gospels. When we look at the first epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians in chapter 1, verse 10, <clears throat> verse 10 through 17, we hear St. Paul's words to the Corinthians, and he's warning them, uh, uh, like a simple warning that requires our attention. <clears throat> it's a similar situation that happened to his gospel. He says, Brethren, I appeal to you by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that all of you agree that there be no dissension among you but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's uh, people that there is quarreling among you, my brethren. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? He goes on to say, I thank God that I baptized none of you except for certain people, right? <clears throat> for St. Paul, the greatest tragedy would be if the church is not united. St. John, they're all going to him. That man that was with you beyond the Jordan, they're all going to him. What are you going to do about it? Don't you care? Doesn't it bother you? St. Paul had the same situation. St. Paul spent his entire life in serious study and prayer, looking for the truth and trying to know God more fully. And he was zealous. He was zealous to be a good disciple of his teachers and his fathers. And his zeal was misguided. And he... And he had this desire to see the truth spread. And he wanted to see false teachings stamped out everywhere. This is why he led attacks on the Christians. And he threw many into prison. And because the zeal was misguided and ill-informed. So one day, by the will of God, we know the story. By the grace of God, our Lord Jesus Christ revealed himself to St. Paul on the road to Damascus. And he set off this chain of events that have rippled through time. Completely changed the course of history. And St. Paul became the apostle to the Gentiles. He spread the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ far and wide. And he had this new focus. Actually, God came into focus more clearly for him. And through the encounter with the risen Lord, St. <clears throat> Paul's world was turned upside down. His life was now fully dedicated to teaching others about Christ and helping others encounter and know this Messiah, <coughs> this Son of God, who can save mankind from their sins. So with all this background, we see St. Paul undertaking major missionary journeys all over the world. In the Roman Empire, he gave the rest of his life to this task of bringing the news of what God has done for humanity. He set up communities. He spent time with them. He loved them. He prayed with them. He encouraged them. And then he would 
pick up and he would move to the next area and start the work again in a new place. And he would bring new souls to Christ. And St. Paul would often hear news about these communities. These communities that he started, some good news, some not so good news. And what St. Paul understood very clearly was that there were a few things that could hurt, if not destroy, a church community. First, false teachings. Second, immorality. And third, dissension or division. And that's what I want to focus on today. Dis dissension or division over small issues, really small issues. This is one thing that St. Paul focused on in the readings that we talked about in 1 Corinthians. What was the issue that began to cause division in the church at Corinth? Well, it was their baptismal lineage. Who had been baptized by whom? Sounds familiar from today's gospel. Some claimed that their baptism was better because it was at the hand of Apollos, some at the hands of uh, St. Peter or Cephas, some at the hands of St. Paul. And this trivial matter became a big issue. It actually divided the people. In our world, there are always things that will divide us if we let them. Today, perhaps we divide over political affiliation. <clears throat> we might divide over our opinions on who serves the most delicious cheeseburger, right? We might divide over trivial matters. And it's not just bad matters, it's a serious sin. We have to be careful. It's the tearing of the fabric of the body of Christ in two. It's shredding a lovely single garment made by the hands of God into pieces. It's a sign of deficiency of love. It's a deficiency of love towards Christ. It's a deficiency of love towards his church and towards those whom Christ gave his life on the tree of the cross. And it shouldn't be this way. We should not be like the world around us that is ill-mannered, ill-tempered, easily provoked, easily offended. Since when in the church? As Christians, we are called to see Christ in every single person and to love every single member of the church with godly love. The things that unite us in Christ are much greater than the trivial, silly things that cause us to separate from one another. And if we find that perhaps our opinions are too strong or too offensive or too harsh or too polarizing, we can choose the path of humility instead of the path of being prideful. This can happen in the church. We're not immune. This can come from a response from the direction of a servant or the direction of a priest or the direction of Metropolitan Stropian himself. Sometimes we have a strong opinion what should be and what shouldn't be. I might disagree with a certain direction that the leadership has put in front of us. We can choose to be peacemakers. And I think our Lord Jesus Christ says something important about being peacemakers. Being the man or woman who works for peace with their fellow brothers and sisters in Christ is more important than feeling right or feeling justified. Not everyone does a good job of showing restraint and thinking about how their comments or their opinions or their actions might serve to actually alienate or to actually push away their fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. We've been warned time and time again, and I thank God that he puts this type of gospel passage in our Sunday readings for us to have a constant reminder of it. We need to be careful. 
We need to make sure that we're not a stumbling block. And this is true in the service. The fact that we don't think about others makes us more than negligent. It makes us selfish. It makes us self-centered. It's basically saying what St. John said not to say. It's basically saying, I must increase. Everybody else must decrease. So, we're called to restrain ourselves and to think of others, to obey, to be humble. This is how we love actively. This is how we honor our Lord Jesus Christ. One of the Eastern Fathers, St. John of Constant, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but he says, As the Holy Trinity, our God is one being, although three persons, so likewise we ourselves must be one. As our God is indivisible, we also must be indivisible, as though we were one man, one mind, one will, one heart, one goodness, without the smallest mingling of malice, and a word, one pure love, as God is love. And he references John chapter 17, verse 22, that they may be one even as we are one. In another place he writes, a Christian must always be kind and gracious and wise in order to conquer evil by good. In the letters of St. Ignatius of Antioch in the second century, we see this emphasis over and over, unity as part of our safety net as Christians. The physical unity of the church <clears throat> is demonstrated by being in submission. This is from St. Ignatius. Being in submission to the local bishop and those by whom the bishop has appointed, namely the priest and the deacons. What's the goal of the unity? It's to maintain the true faith and the doctrine and the practices of the apostles and to pass them down faithfully. Within this authentic faith and doctrine and practices as handed down is also the authentic life and joy in Christ. As I mentioned before, these days that we live in are full of division. Families oftentimes are divided. And this begins when spouses are not on the same page. When spouses don't live to serve one another, but to control one another. Citizens in the country are also divided. Neighbors can be divided against one another, and the list goes on. So, <clears throat> how do we reclaim this unity and protect the church? What's required for the unity of the church? Well, the first thing is a deep love for Christ. A deep love, authentic love for Christ. It's an understanding that the church is the body of Christ. If each and every person in the church has a deep love for our Lord Jesus Christ, this love unites us. And having a shared love means living with shared goals. Chief, each if each one of us loves Christ and sees the church as the body of Christ, we will always act carefully in order not to harm or not to divide the church. We would be very critical with our actions and our movements, our decisions. We would always act with the goal of honoring Christ and loving Christ first and foremost. Practically speaking, we would guard our lips. We would guard what comes out of our lips. We would avoid entering into discussions that will likely inflame. This causes division. Listen to what St. James says. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. We have to be warned and pay attention that what we say must be carefully weighed. We have to pay attention to what we say. 
St. Paul reminds us that we should avoid controversies regardless of the subject matter. Again, this happens in the church. St. Paul gives us an important point regarding maintaining peace in the church. He tells us that not only do we have to be lowly and meek, but patient with others. In our day, in our day-to-day actions, in our lives, it's really easy to become impatient with people. We're always in a hurry. We always expect things to be done our way, right away. Oftentimes, we're impatient. We're impatient with those that we deal with on a regular basis. Our families, our siblings, our spouses, sometimes our co-workers. It can even happen in the life of the church, especially in a close-knit community. We have to pray for the gift of patience and peace in every situation. Rather than looking at a situation as a chance to have our voices heard, we should look at the situation as a chance for God's love to be reflected. If we knew even a fraction of what it was required to bring our fellow brothers and sisters to Christ in the church, we would guard them from all harm, like a shepherd does with his sheep. This is what it means to put on the mind of Christ. When we put on the mind of Christ, then our life is in harmony with the teachings of our Lord, and we will be filled with peace. So just to conclude, whenever there are worries and fears and anxieties, we will find division. Whenever people lack a unifying goal, a unifying purpose, we find division. Whenever people are afraid of death, there will be sin, and this causes great division. Satan is working overtime. He is working overtime to confuse and to divide the people of God. And he divides them from one another, and then he attacks them when they're isolated and alone. As Christians, we protect ourselves by running to Christ to running to the church. This is our safe place. Our Lord Jesus Christ prayed for our unity. St. John says, I must decrease and I am not the Christ. St. Paul says, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? No. We are called to be united. And our Christian life is a life of struggling to become united in our bodies, in our hearts, in our souls. To harmonize everything within us to the service of Christ. So this is our life in the church. Unity within. Unity with our neighbors. Unity with the teachings and the life of the church itself, which is the body of Christ. Unity with the Holy Trinity. All of this ensures that we will not be lost, we will not be misguided, we will not be misdirected. It ensures that we are on the right path, this path of salvation. And as he has prayed for us and given us his bride, the one church, as a place for this unity to be made powerfully present in our lives, may our Lord Jesus Christ, our God, our Lord, unite our hearts and our minds and bring us to the true worship and love. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Bless.